and welcome to today's webinar. We are excited to have you all here today. This webinar is being presented by the Adult Down Syndrome Center. We are a clinic for adolescents and adults with Down Syndrome, and we are located in Park Ridge, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. We are very excited for our presenter today. Our presenter is Dr. Katie Frank, and she has worked as an occupational therapist at the Adult Down Syndrome Center since 2016, and in the field of occupational therapy since 2001. She earned her occupational therapy degree from St. Louis University and her PhD in disability studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Most of her work has been with individuals with Down syndrome and she has worked with individuals of all ages. Her experience includes treatment and evaluation, as well as facilitating groups for people with Down syndrome, conducting trainings for staff, families, and caregivers, and offering a variety of other educational opportunities across the United States. She also does research, and her research has been published in peer-reviewed journals. Before I turn it over to Dr. Frank, I have a few reminders. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available in our resource library. We will also send a link to the recording in a follow-up email to all attendees. Um, we have a Q&A option um, and there will be time for questions at the end. And please submit any questions um, related to the webinar using that Q&A button um, in your toolbar. All attendees are muted and um, their videos have been turned off, but you can contact us using that Q&A button. Um, as a final reminder, this information is provided for educational purposes only, and we encourage attendees to bring this information to their healthcare providers or the healthcare providers of their loved ones so that they can get um, information specific to their loved one. And now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Frank. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, the agenda for the day is that we're going to discuss sensory processing and how it impacts our loved ones with Down syndrome. I'm going to share some practical sensory activities and suggestions for affordable equipment and then provide some case examples so that you can see how I util uh, utilize sensory strategies here at the Adult Down Syndrome Center. So first, let's talk a little bit about our sensory system. I want you to think about your sensory system being like electrical wiring and here the wiring is intact and the light remains on. And this is because the messages are being able to be sent from the brain to wherever they need to go in the body. I also wanna warn you in this next one, that there are some flashing lights. So I don't, um, if you are sensitive to that, I suggest looking away for um, just under a minute. But here there's a kink in the wire. And when this happens, it might cause our internal lights to flicker. And sometimes we get a kink in our central nervous system and it leads to these mixed messages being sent from our brain to where it needs to go in the rest of the body. And many times we might not know what's causing the kink or how to stop it and to, um, so that we can keep our internal lights on. So when sensory processing is disorderly, the brain cannot do its uh, most important job of organizing these sensory messages. So I don't know about you, but when I watch this flickering light, it is making me feel a little anxious, so I'm gonna flip the slide. So when there is a kink in our nervous system, we might experience our senses of touch and taste, sound, smell, movement, and other sensations just differently. We might feel sensations more intensely, while someone else might feel them less so. And some just don't get the sensory information right. We feel something that is soft and smooth. We think it's a button when in reality, it's a penny. And really this can impact our behavior. We may see verbal outbursts or physical aggression either towards self or others, maybe destruction of property, defiance, disobedience, non-compliance, tantrums or meltdowns. Maybe the person might manipulate a situation for their own benefit or disregard the needs of others. Uh, maybe we just might see non-conformity with social norms or expectations. We could see slowing down and shutting down. And some may think that the person is acting out on purpose or behaving inappropriately. 
when it really could be dysfunction in their sensory system because those messages are not being sent from the brain to the body and so their internal lights are flickering. And similarly, kinks in our electrical wiring could be ca the cause of symptoms of anxiety. And as a result, we might see self-talk or even compulsive behaviors. We might feel like fireworks are going off in our body or ants are crawling on our skin and we don't know how to stop. So we might see someone act out. And this is because the fireworks are keeping the messages from traveling from our brain to the rest of our body. So some of these anxiety provoking events could be blood draws or going to the dentist, getting hair or nails cut, you know, even having trouble with changes to routine. And it's possible that incorporating sensory input prior to these anxiety producing activities may improve tolerance. Um, you know, individuals with Down syndrome also might have some compulsive tendencies and sometimes this can slow them down. And so sensory strategies may help speed up tasks by limiting the effect that that compulsive tendency has on them. And so, you know, thinking of the compulsion as that kink, and if the kink isn't present, then that person can move on without that compulsion holding them back. And so we're going to talk again about how these sensory strategies can help with um, anxiety and some compulsive behaviors. And the way I really like to talk about it is I want you to think about your body or your sensory system like a teeter-totter. So we have our highs and our lows every day, and sometimes our sensory system might be over-responsive where it's up high or under-responsive where it's down low. Um, but often what we really want is for our body to be regulated and for our teeter-totter to be even. And so our goal is to ensure that the teeter-totter stays even throughout the day. And when we see some changes in, in behavior, um, before just thinking that it's sensory or even thinking that it's behavior, it's really important to rule out um, some of these medical causes. So if there's changes in sleep, they're not getting as you know, good of sleep or they're sleeping too much, then we might see a behavior change. If there's some GI issues or pain, perhaps undiagnosed celiac disease, allergies, troubles with communication, we already talked about anxiety or OCD or any other mental health issues and seizures or neurological conditions. So again, if there's ever a quick behavior change, I highly recommend seeing a medical professional first to make sure it's nothing uh, physical and then seeing if it's something else. So you might refer to other, um, other providers, whether it's an OT or a psychologist to see if there's any other reason for this behavior change. But some questions to ask yourself when you see a behavior change to see if perhaps it is sensory. One, does the person's action disrupt your life? So for example, do you or your family have to avoid certain places because of noises or crowds or smells? Oftentimes we might hear families can no longer go to restaurants or a specific restaurant because something that could, be, could have happened in the environment. So if the answer to this question is yes, and there could be a sensory component to the behavior. The second question is, does the action occur with everyone? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably sensory. Because if the individual can pick and choose who they do this action or behavior with, then it's probably more a behavior. Or if it only happens at home, but not at school, or it happens only with the grandparents, or it only happens with mom instead of dad, then you wanna look more at it of it as a behavior and figure out why they're doing it. But if it happens with everyone and it can happen anywhere, it's probably sensory. And then the third question is, does the person stop the action when given a reward? And I want you to know that if the individual is having a meltdown because of a sensory issue, no sticker or cookie or time on the tablet or getting their phone back is gonna fix the situation. Right, so if it's sensory, no matter what they receive, they're not gonna stop the meltdown. But if it's truly behavioral, the individual can turn um, their reaction on and on, like on and off, like a light switch. And it might um, only occur with one or two people or only in a certain environment. So again, it's probably sensory if it um, impacts your ability to you know, be out in the community, if it can occur with everyone, and if rewards don't solve the issue. Lucy Jane Miller wrote this quote, and she is kind of like the, the godmother of sensory processing when it comes to occupational therapy. And again, um, this is 
geared towards children, but you can think about it about individuals in general. So the hallmark of individuals with sensory processing disorder is that their sensory difficulties are chronic and disrupt their everyday life. Individuals with sensory processing disorder get stuck, just like Winnie the Pooh here. And no matter what strategies a determined parent uses, whether it's stickers on a chart, praise, discipline, or some technique another, other, another parent said worked for them, kids with sensory processing disorder just stay stuck. So again, these are also talking about behavior strategies. So if um, you are working with a behaviorist or you know your child's in school and they have a behavior plan and nothing seems to be working, perhaps you should reanalyze and see if there's some sensory component happening that is leading to these reactions. So I've been talking about sensory processing disorder, but what is it? It's really an umbrella term to cover a variety of neurological disabilities. And I kept, you know, I talked about at the beginning, it's that inability for the messages to do, to be sent from the brain to the rest of the body. But when it's really a problem, it's because it impacts the ability for a person to function in their daily life. Like I said before, like families not being able to go to restaurants anymore, even though that was something that the family really cherishes. But I want you to know that sensory processing is not, it's not an eating disorder. Someone can be a picky eater and not having an eating, have an eating disorder, right? You can have sensory processing disorder and it's not anxiety although someone may also have anxiety. Same with ADHD. Oftentimes, individuals are misdiagnosed with ADHD when really there could be a sensory processing component to their inattentive behavior. It is not bipolar disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder, although someone can have sensory challenges and OCD, and it is not autism spectrum disorder. So this was something that was misunderstood very early on. All of us can have sensory processing challenges and that does not mean that all of us have autism. Sensory challenges are a small piece of autism spectrum disorder, but they are also something that can be common in Down syndrome and does not mean that that person has autism. So the reason I talk about all of that is because Individuals might go and see a medical provider and get misdiagnosed with one of those medical conditions I just said, because the provider doesn't understand sensory. And so then the person is treated with either medication or other therapies, and they're not addressing the underlying sensory issue. I like to joke with families that the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, I can do that with sensory. You come in with, with the challenge and I can bring it back to, to sensory and, and, and within the six degrees, typically. Doesn't mean that's always the case, but as an OT, I can always come up with a reason why sensory could be a cause. And like I said, many of us have sensory problems occasionally or even regularly, but that doesn't mean we have SPD or sensory processing disorder. But again, once that sensory problem interferes with our daily life and becomes a disruption, that's when we really need to consider it. You know, I tell everyone I don't like to eat oranges. It feels like fireworks going off in my mouth. I also, when I was little, didn't like to wear denim, but now I can wear denim and I just avoid or oranges and life is great for me. Um, the other tricky thing about sensory processing disorder is many physicians are not diagnosing it anymore, um, which is not actually a problem in my opinion, because it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So OTs, we can find other ways to get the sensory treatment, even if the person doesn't come to us with sensory processing disorder diagnosis. And the other thing I like to, you know, I've mentioned this with the anxiety, the how our body might feel. I tell families, and just like I did with the oranges, it could feel like fireworks are going off in your body, your ants are crawling on your skin, and that's not a fun feeling. And so the sensory strategies we're going to talk about can hopefully help resolve some of those feelings that we're getting that feel like fireworks or ants so that we can be more in tune with what's going on during our day and able to learn and participate. Um, and so that's really what we're going to talk about today. I don't know if you knew, but there are actually eight senses, not just the five we're familiar with. So the five we know, um, or have, we're always taught, would be touch, sight, smell, sound, and taste. And we look at those as the far sensory systems. But we also have near sensory systems. So the first one is vestibular. Um, this has to do with our balance, right? It helps us sit or stand upright. 
know whether we're laying down or standing up or about to fall, right? It, it makes when we change our head position, perhaps we feel dizzy or stop feeling dizzy and it's just how we move through space. Then there's proprioception. And this sense tells us about where our body is in space, how we move our arms and legs, or we exert the just right pressure, whether we do things too hard or too soft on objects. And we can discriminate how fast our body is moving. And then there's interoception. And this sense provides um, information about senses coming from within our body. So think about your heart rate, um, the ability to feel hunger or thirst or feeling full, the need to use the restroom, to digest food and just sweat. We're not gonna talk a lot about the interoception system today. We're gonna focus primarily on the proprioception system. We're gonna talk a little bit more about far and near sensory systems when we talk about treatment. But as far as treating in, until we get to specific sensory diets, the near sensory systems um, require activities, often involving therapy in order to treat, whereas the far sensory systems can be addressed by providing accommodations. So again, those far sensory systems are vestibular, proprioceptive, and interoceptive, and the near are sight, um, sound, taste, smell, and, oh gosh, touch. Um, so, this is where it becomes tricky because in school settings, oftentimes the sensory activities are easier, the sensory accommodations, excuse me, are easier to provide than the sensory activities uh, because of time. But we know that it is important first to take care of the near sensory system, so vestibular, proprioceptive, and interoceptive, in order to allow our far sensory systems to work better. And so that's where the challenge comes for school-based therapists and why you will hear that I frequently suggest seeking outpatient therapy to address sensory needs. But I want you to think about this. So let's say a person has trouble with their proprioceptive system. And so then we want to incorporate heavy work activities or activities that require pushing and pulling that will encourage them to use their muscles and joints more to increase their body awareness. So that would be providing a sensory activity. But that same person might also not like to be in gymnasiums during basketball games because of the loud noises. Well, it's whether it's the you know, ref's whistle, the buzzer, the fans yelling, the ball bouncing. And so then we can make an accommodation by encouraging them to wear sound reducing headphones. And so then that way we would be addressing auditory system, which is part of the far sensory system and provide an accommodation. So the difference between an activity for your near senses versus an accommodation for your far. But again, we will get into this more when we talk about treatment. There are some common sensory deficits that we do see in Down syndrome. So with the tactile system, we see that individuals might not to tolerate certain clothing types, or they don't like the um, tags in their clothing, or they don't like the seams in their socks. You know, maybe they don't tolerate lotion on their skin. We see this a lot. Or brushing their teeth. Maybe they don't like water on their face in general. When it comes to sound, we often hear that they love to listen to their music really loud, but they don't tolerate other loud sounds. Especially they don't like when babies cry, dogs bark, or sirens pass by. When it comes to the visual system, they often have poor depth perception, making stairs and uneven surfaces challenging. With proprioception, uh, I frequently hear that individuals stuff food in their mouth. And this could be, again, because of proprioception, the awareness um, of your body. And so they might not feel the food in their mouth until they've stuffed enough in there so that one small bite they're not going to start chewing because their body doesn't sense that there's food in their mouth but once they might have four or five pieces of food in their mouth they they feel the weight of it they're more aware of the food in their mouth and then they start to chew and then we've heard you know difficulty regulate regulating force so doing things too hard or too soft perhaps they hold their pencil really soft 
um, or light, which makes handwriting difficult, but they play really rough with siblings or they pet the dog really hard or they hug too tight, right? So they can't control how hard or soft they do things. And then there's our interoceptive system. So individuals with Down, system, Down syndrome, difficulty, um, they have a difficulty feeling if they're thirsty. So we know that water intake is usually poor because they don't feel thirst. We know they don't sweat very much. They also don't feel satiation or full. So sometimes they tend to overeat because they don't have that awareness of being full and needing to stop eating. And then toilet training can often be challenging in the early years. And again, because they don't have that feeling of their bladder being full and needing to be emptied. So this is not an all-inclusive list. Um, this is also not the only sensory um, deficits we see in Down syndrome, but see, these are some of the ones we hear the most. So kind of as a wrap up, the common reactions we see when it comes to sensory is that the person is unable to calm themselves down even after they get what they want. And the response is the same with everyone. So some tricks to help would be to provide sensory input at regular intervals. And we're gonna talk about a sensory diet. Perhaps you just need to find a positive timeout in a calm space. Just get them that opportunity to move away from whatever is going on to relax. But it's also important to try to determine what these sensory triggers are and find ways to avoid, modify, or adapt to them. So you might be thinking, well, that's great, Katie, but who can help with this? So I'm going to tell you all about occupational therapy and why occupational therapists should help. I like to say uh, that OT does not stand for the other therapy. Um, I used to work in peds at a Down syndrome clinic, and I felt like parents always wanted their kids to be able to walk and talk, and they didn't really think about anything else. And all of that other stuff that um, the individuals with Down syndrome need to do, occupational therapy can help with because OT is a health profession concerned with how people function in their respective roles and how they perform meaningful activities. Our occupation is any activity in which one engages throughout the day. So I like to say, whatever you need to do from the moment you go to, to wake up to the moment you go to sleep and even sleep itself, an OT can help with. So what is OT's role in sensory processing? OT, um, Practitioners really are person-centered. So we're going to look at the, the person and the environment and try to figure out what's interfering with that person's ability to engage in activities. And oftentimes it can be an impaired sensory system. So if it is a sensory system issue, we will address it. If it's not, we can try to address um, the reasons what could be um, interfering. And if we don't know what to do, we're going to refer out. Right. The trick, though, is that not all OTs are comfortable working with individuals who have sensory dysfunction. So we receive this training in school, but it's brief. And if it's kind of like if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And so when you go to certain settings and work as an OT, you may not be um, addressing sensory processing needs as regularly. And so you sort of forget what you're supposed to be doing. Um, other challenges are that Many times it's the OTs that work in pediatrics that are addressing sensory processing. So what happens then if you're an adolescent or adult who needs help with sensory processing, who can you see? Because OTs who tend to work with adolescents and adults tend to work in physical rehab, right? You go and see an OT because you're not able to do self-care anymore because let's say you had an accident and you, know, you have to relearn how to get dressed. For instance, well, those OTs probably aren't gonna be able to address sensory. So where can you turn to? Um, I don't have the answer to that either because it's tricky. There are some pediatric clinics who might see adolescents and adults with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities that need help with sensory processing, but it might not be age appropriate. So the person themselves, that person with Down syndrome may not like going there because it seems too childish. Um, the other tricky part, though, is with insurance. So sometimes those pediatric clinics, even if they're willing to see someone, either insurance or the hospital themselves, once they become a certain age, won't qualify for services in that pediatric setting. And then, like I said, if they go to an adult setting, they might not have the equipment or the skills in order to address this. So I do highly recommend reaching out to your pediatric clinic to see if they know any OTs that work with adolescents and adults, or perhaps seeing if your pediatrician knows of any therapists. 
um, or reaching out to your local Down syndrome association to see if they refer out to any um, OTs that are able to see adolescents and adults uh, with Down syndrome and sensory needs. And so the thing is, there are these formal assessments to diagnose sensory processing deficits, but really individuals with Down syndrome may not tolerate them or be able to participate in them. And also, you know, the formal assessments aren't going to really be able to say whether it's sensory or whether it's, you know, that behavior change because of a true behavior or whether it's a medical cause. And so a therapist really has to use clinical judgment and some trial and error. But I kind of, I said diagnose in quotation marks because OTs, it is outside of our scope of practice to actually diagnose. So we would never say, oh yeah, you have sensory processing um, disorder. We might say, oh, well, there seem to be some sensory needs that are impacting, you know, your loved one's ability to complete self-care skills or participate in the school setting, or it's impacting their work. And that's what we would treat we don't actually diagnose. And so I do want to share um, some testing for sensory processing differences. Most of these are for pediatric aged clients. So the sensory processing measure is great, but it's only for ages five to 12, unless you do the preschool one, which is ages two to five. And again, it's a parent questionnaire. It's not some formal diagnosis but it is in a variety of languages and not in Spanish. So again, I don't know if there's anyone who has a child with Down syndrome, but that might be appropriate. Same with the sensory profile two. This is for birth to 14 years, 11 months. Um, there are also infant and toddler forms, and there's also this adolescent adult sensory profile. So that's great because it's ages 11 and older. I do have it here at the clinic. The tricky thing about the adolescent adult sensory profile is that it is pages long. It is written with some double negatives and it's supposed to be completed by the individual themselves. Obviously I don't ask the person with Down syndrome to complete it, but if the person with Down syndrome can answer some of my questions, I will ask them those questions, but oftentimes it's the parent answering the question. So then when I score it, I can't say that it's the true reflection of what is going on because this is just the parent's opinion, right? So it's not the true use of how the adolescent adult sensory profile was set up. There's also the SIPT, which is the Sensory Integration and Praxis Test. This is a test that you have to be um, trained in order to carry out, but this can help identify specific sensory processing um, challenges. Unfortunately, it's only for four years um, old to eight years, 11 months, so a very limited age range. It's super expensive to administer. Insurance doesn't often cover it. They are revamping it, so hopefully it can be um, extended to a larger age range. But the problem is, is that it's hours long. And I just can't imagine someone with Down syndrome tolerating it and performing the best of their ability for hours at a time. So what I really like to use is this sensory systems checklist. And there's versions in English and Spanish. And here is an example of just some of the two of the pages of it. So it's simple language. All the family has to do is check mark um, if anything is currently present. And this helps me as a therapist get a, a picture of what could be going on because I am not going to see all of that when you come to clinic to see me, right? The, the person with Down syndrome is probably going to be on their best behavior and I'm not going to see any of it because they know they're supposed to act great because they're at the doctor's office, right? But families can check mark um, what's going on now. They can write notes to me about this used to happen. It doesn't happen anymore, whatever it might be. And then I look at it and it tells me that and well, whether someone is over responsive in a sensory system, meaning that the littlest thing can set them off, they have a very low tolerance or they're under responsive. So they might need a lot of sensory input in order to can get their teeter totter even, right? They're really low and they need a lot to get up here. Whereas the over responsive is up here and we, it's gonna take you know, just a little bit to get them to go up right? And we need to bring them back down. And so this checklist is really nice. It's free, available online at the link provided um, to kind of see where your loved one might be. And it's for all age ranges. So going back to the role of OT and sensory processing, I said this before, I'm going to say it again. Oftentimes direct therapy in an outpatient setting is going to be best uh, just because they're going to have the resources, um, the equipment, the education, and in order to provide this therapy in school, they just don't have the time. It's not that they don't have the knowledge to do it, but 
oftentimes, I mean, I know here they might get, if they're even getting OT, it might be like 20 minutes a week at most. It could be 20 minutes a month. And if that amount of time is not enough time to address your sensory need. So OTs are gonna provide a sensory diet, which we're gonna talk about in detail. And this can include a combination of alerting, calming and organizing activities. It's highly individualized. So it's really gonna depend on what that person needs. Just like Lucy Jane Miller's quote, doesn't matter what one parent said worked magic for them, right? Because it might not work magic for your loved one. It's really highly individualized. It's often trial and error, which families hate to hear, but we really have to figure out what that best sensory activity is going to be for each person. And modifications to the sensory diet can be made in any kind of setting. And a good OT is gonna make sure that the recommendations are gonna be able to be included in a classroom work day program setting, as well as home. Um, so that it's something that's really gonna benefit the individual. And there's some reasons to seek treatment because the person's not gonna outgrow some of these sensory processing deficits. Just like I said, I mean, I, I've, sort of outgrown the denim. I've gotten used to it. Now they make, you know, jagging. So that makes it even better. Um, more, just more comfortable material makes me able to wear denim clothes, right? I just don't eat oranges, but I bet if I put an orange in my mouth right now, I'd have that same feeling. Our sensory system does grow and change with us, but we're always going to have probably some kind of sensory processing deficit. So the treatment is going to help that person function more smoothly. They're going to have strategies that they can incorporate so that they can get through the day. Often when someone has some sensory issues, they're going to have trouble in social situations. So if we can regulate their body, they're going to develop those social skills and be good in those social situations. If I had fireworks going off in my body all the time, it would be impacting my learning. So again, it's gonna help them have their teeter-totter even, so they're open to new learning opportunities. They're not gonna have these tantrums anymore, so it's gonna improve their emotional well-being and improve family relationships, because I'm sure parents might fight over what they're doing and you know they each have different opinions about what needs to happen. Um, it's just causing anxiety for the whole family, especially if you can't do activities that you love doing as a family. And so getting treatment is going to help improve those family relationships. So let's talk more about the sensory diet. We've talked about what sensory processing is, how it might appear, but I know you really want those take home messages about what can be done to help. So again, a sensory diet is a planned and scheduled activity program that is highly individualized. And it's designed to provide the right combination of sensory input to keep an optimal level or arousal of performance, right? To keep our teeter-totter even. And we can incorporate a sensory diet before an activity, and that can maybe help that person move through or transition or prepare for a change in routine more easily. But it can also be used as a recovery technique if that person does become overwhelmed and acts out. Now, if they're starting to become overwhelmed, that's not when you're gonna be like, oh, here, let's you know, go ride a bike, right? You need to wait till they calm down before you get in their space to encourage a sensory activity, but it can be used to calm them once kind of that tantrum or meltdown is over. And a good sensory diet can be implemented at home and in the community. The tricky thing is though, that it should be more like choosing from a menu rather than following a recipe. So it's not, if this happens, then you do this, this, and this. It needs to be, here are all of the things that I can choose from today. Which one is my body kind of craving, right? It's also kind of like a toolbox. In your toolbox at home, I'm sure you have multiple sizes of Phillips and flathead screwdrivers, and you never know which one's exactly right. And you take one out, you're like, oh, nope, that one's too big. You take another one out, oh, no, that's too small. And then you find the just right one. And that's the same thing when it comes to a sensory diet. So you have your toolbox, you have to pick and choose and try to see what that just right fit is for that day. And that's why a sensory diet is highly individualized. And I do say it may not necessarily be convenient. And obviously we want to try to make it as convenient as possible, but you might need to, again, have that toolbox or have that toolbox that you carry with you so that there are options for when there are, you know, you are in the community, things like that. And as far as the timing, the other thing, and I think this is really important because I've seen this a lot, is that oftentimes people get 
um, an activity as a reward or removed as a punishment. And many sensory strategies involve movement. And so they should never be given as a reward or moved as punishment, removed as punishment. If a person needs a sensory strategy, they need it in order to function. I also heard a funny story that um, there was an individual, I believe they had Down syndrome and they kept acting out. And so their punishment was to um, vacuum. You know, and so the parent thought that they were actually punishing them because they had to clean. And that's, you know, a terrible thing. You're like, who wants to clean or chooses to clean? However, you're going to find that vacuuming is really great proprioceptive input because it's pushing and pulling. There's some vibration to it. It's giving our body sensory input. So the individual didn't see it as punishment. They thought they were actually being rewarded for their bad behavior because they got to vacuum every time they acted out. So that's kind of the opposite of what I was just saying. But you just need to be aware and know that many of the actions we do and when it comes to sensory, we need. And so not to punish someone by removing it because they act out. And that's the other thing about in school. Teachers are frequently taking away recess from children when they're acting out in the classroom. But that's actually punishing both the kid and the teacher because that kid might need recess after lunch in order to learn and be open to learning for the rest of the day and to attend. And when you take away recess, they're not getting that physical activity they need, that proprioceptive input, and it's gonna p- impact everyone's, um, the rest of everyone's day. So when you're looking at a sensory diet or when an OT is looking at a sensory diet, we look at activities that might be alerting um, or calming or organizing. And again, the goal is to keep the teeter-totter even. So alerting activities benefit that under-responsive person, that person that needs the boost. So they are way down here on the teeter-totter and they need more activity in order to get them to be even out. So it could be something like eating crunchy food, not taking a cold shower, but taking more like a lukewarm shower, kind of, you know, we're like jumping into a pool instead of taking a hot bath or um, getting into a jacuzzi maybe bouncing on a trampoline, or if they can't bounce on a trampoline, sitting on a therapy ball and bouncing up and down. Perhaps swinging in a circle, so like on a tire swing, or just swinging really fast. Then there's organizing activities, and these help regulate the person's responses so they can be more attentive. So I'm sure, I mean, we're only, you know, like 35 minutes into this, but adults, we are not geared towards sitting and learning anymore. When we were kids, we did it, but adult learners don't do well that way. So I don't know how many of you might be, you know, swinging your foot or tapping your foot or clicking on a pen, chewing gum, something like that. If you're, you go to, you know, we're on Zoom all the time now, you have to get up and move around. Those are all organizing activities that you're doing to try to keep your teeter-totter even. So individuals with Down syndrome need that also. So it could be eating chewy foods, or doing some heavy work activities, um, which we're gonna talk about. But again, those are uh, anything that require our, our muscles and joints to move and vibration. And then there's calming activities. And this is gonna help decrease the person that has sensory over responsiveness. So that person that the littlest thing sets them off, they need to be calm. We might ask for them to suck on hard candy or again, do that heavy work. You're gonna see that heavy work can be alerting, organizing, or calming, which is one of the reasons I use proprioceptive input so much. Um, Perhaps for calming, it's swinging back and forth. So like a hammock or a porch swing, maybe a rocking chair. You can do deep pressure. So big hugs or being rolled into a blanket like a burrito or squeezed between couch cushions or getting a massage or joint compression, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. This is where weighted vests or blankets can come in, maybe playing with a fidget, perhaps a sound machine. But again, the thing is, it's all very individualized. And I know I brought up the terms under-responsive and over-responsive in this. We're not getting into that too much today, but you can be under-responsive in one sensory system and over-responsive in another. So perhaps you're under-responsive in um, touch systems. So that's gonna be someone who needs a lot of touch in order to um, have their teeter-totter where you could be over-responsive to sound and that's the person that doesn't like the loud sounds and and covers their ears. Um, But again, we're not gonna get into that today. That's not the important thing um, for this lecture. 
So again, we talked earlier about the far and near sensory system. So let's talk more about the treatment when it comes to the sensory diet. So sensory accommodations for the far senses and then those sensory activities for the near. And we often need to address the near sensory systems before we can make an impact with the far sensory system. So again, we need those activities to keep our teeter-totter even before we can um, work on those accommodations to help with the FAR. So what might that look like? Sensory accommodation examples. So again, for things like sight and sound and touch and taste and smell. Someone may need sunglasses for bright light or because they don't like bright light, they might need dim lighting. Maybe they get so visually overstimulated in the classroom, they need to sit in the front row or have a study corral so that they don't get distracted by everything going on around them. For someone with sound, maybe they need headphones. They can need headphones because they don't like the sounds going on, so they might have sound reducing headphones, or they might need something more for calming. So they have headphones with like calm music, maybe classical music, or even a sound machine going on so that they can relax. When it comes to touch, they might need gloves if they don't like um, the feeling of things sticky or their hands being dirty, um, perhaps clothing without labels because they don't like how the label feels against their skin, or they need to have fidgets because they constantly need to touch everything. So we give them something that they can fidget with in their hands. For taste, maybe they are really sensitive, so they need bland foods for flavor instead of spicy foods, or that person who needs a lot of sensory input might crave those spicy foods. Or we might see someone who um, chewing, can, it's not that it's just hard, but um, it, they're, they're sensitive to chewing. And so they might need those soft puree foods or someone who really needs all that sensory input into their mouth might crave crunchy foods. Then when it comes to smells, if they're really oversensitive to smells, I know I am, you might need an air purifier to try to eliminate some of those scents and trying to limit perfume or lotion scents. Or maybe they love different smells and so you have air fresheners to kind of alert them or aromatherapy. And again, aromatherapy can either alert them, it could organize or it could calm them depending on what they need and depending on what scent you use. But when it comes to sensory activity, I like to use proprioceptive input. And it's really the first strategy I use here at the Adult Down Syndrome Center. And it's because individuals with Down syndrome tend to have low muscle tone, which is not news to any of us. And this really can impact how they interpret sensory input coming in through their muscles and joints. So again, if you think of that teeter-totter example, they're down like this and they need more input to get their um, system level, their teeter-totter even, because they, they need that extra. They need more than we think they need to bring them back up. But why is this important? So there's research that tells us that deep pressure input is supposed to have a calming and organizing effect on our central nervous system, which is our sensory system. And it helps lower the states of arousal, which results in positive behavioral and emotional outcomes. And we find that individuals may actually present with this sudden behavior change when their natural opportunities for proprioceptive input have changed. So when they're no longer in school, so whether it's for the summer or they graduate and then they're in a transition program or they're finished with a transition program and they're not getting that regular proprioceptive input, we see a change in behavior. When COVID started and everything shut down and people were home so much, we saw huge changes in behavior because they lost their ability for natural sensory input. So many of these strategies that I'm gonna talk about can be alerting or organizing or calming really depending on that person's needs. But the first thing you can do is just everyday activities like chores. I already talked about vacuuming. It could be laundry, wiping down counters. When it snows out, if you live somewhere where it snows, shoveling or raking leaves, pushing a wheelbarrow, like all of that input into our muscles and joints is great. Same thing with exercise. It just naturally provides proprioceptive input. Joint compression is a type of proprioceptive input that's kind of like a mini massage, and I have a hand on that next. And what's great about proprioceptive or joint compression is that you don't need any equipment. You just need your two hands. And I only do the upper body. You don't even need to do the lower body because a person naturally gets joint compression through their hips and knees and ankles and feet when they walk. So that's really great. 
Um, and if that person with Down syndrome really likes joint compression, they can perform a, a push up against a wall or a counter or a desk all on their own. And that's naturally giving them um, this feeling of joint compression when they're doing push ups. The thing I really like about proprioceptive input is when you exercise, they say you get this exercise high because you're endorphins. Well, and I'm not going to say that any of that is wrong. I actually also feel that when you're getting this input, you're actually trying to make, you're making your teeter totter even. And so that's how you should be feeling throughout the day. So that's why I think it's really great for these natural um, opportunities for proprioceptive input to help even out our teeter totter and to give us that exercise high. Um, Vibration is a great um, strategy that can provide proprioceptive input as well as weighted objects. So you see here pictures of a weighted blanket as well as the weighted snake around um, her shoulders. You know, it's a great thing to trial, but again, what works for one person isn't gonna work for another. So not everyone likes weighted objects. And it also has to do with the amount of weight, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And then natural physical activity. So whether it's riding a bike or playing sports, walking, swimming, those are all other ways to naturally get proprioceptive input throughout the day. So these are some resources we have in the resource library, which we will give you access to because all of you will be getting the slides for this presentation. So this is a handout that talks about what proprioceptive input is and natural activities that you can do, just like what we talked about, um, a minute ago throughout the day to provide proprioceptive input. There's a handout on joint compression that gives step-by-step -step instructions about how to do it. And then there's even a handout about affordable sensory equipment recommendations, because if you look at sensory equipment, it's often very expensive if you look in a catalog. And so here are some alternatives that you can do that are, are maybe more affordable. It's also really important for me to share something right now about weighted products, especially weighted blankets. So first off, I want you to know that it is recommended that a weighted blanket be seven to 10% of a person's body weight and not more. I get that question a lot, seven to 10% of someone's body weight. However, if something less than that works best, great. So there's no problem with that, but oftentimes um, people are using too heavy of weighted blankets. And I want you to see in this example, this is a commercial weighted blanket, and they actually advertise weights that are more than the recommended 7 to 10%. So for instance, in this example, the suggested weight ranges are actually 14 to 26% of someone's body weight. I mean, they're telling you that if you weigh 22 pounds, you should be wearing using a five pound blanket, whereas I'm telling you, you shouldn't be using a five pound blanket, um, you know, the max would be a 50 pound person, right? And they, their 50 pound person is using a 12 pound blanket. So please do not refer to the weight suggestions when choosing a weighted blanket if you're buying a commercial weighted blanket. It's also um, highly recommended not to sleep under a weighted blanket. And I know that's how they're advertised, but especially if there are concerns for seizures or asthma or sleep apnea or cardiac issues. But a weighted blanket can be used as part of a bedtime routine in order to calm before falling asleep. Um, the other thing is weighted blankets don't need to be the whole size of the bed, right? They can be much more narrow. And then if someone happens to fall asleep under them, it's not that big of a deal. They can easily get out from under them. So if someone has a queen size bed, you do not need a queen size weighted blanket. Um, it's also best to make sure that products, weighted products are used with supervision to ensure safety. And then the other thing about sensory products, all of them, not just weighted blankets, is that we don't really need sensory input for more than let's say 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes at a time. I'm sorry, not 20 minutes a day. And this is because once our body realizes something's not causing harm, it tunes it out. So for those of you that wear reading glasses, perhaps you might put them up on your head and then an hour later wonder where you put them and not even feel that they're on your head anymore. It's the same with sensory strategies. So what I like to recommend with all of the sensory um, input strategies that we talk about when I create a sensory diet, I suggest sensory input could be for as minimum as five minutes, up to 20 minutes, every two to three hours throughout the day, having some kind of activity that is going to provide natural sensory input is how I like to kind of plan my sensory diet. So we're going to go through a couple case examples real quickly, because um, I want to make sure that we still have time for questions, because I'm sure there's going to be a bunch. But I mentioned that individuals with Down syndrome often have trouble with blood draws or other medical procedures um, that could be anxiety provoking. 
So I want to tell you about my friend who's 24 years old, has a fear of blood draws. You, you know, he needs to be held down on either side in order to get the blood draw. If you were to walk by the room when he's getting it, he sounds like he's being tortured. But as soon as the blood draws over, he walks out with a smile on his face and acts like it wasn't a big deal. So what can we do to help someone like that when it comes to sensory strategies? So with um, this person in particular, uh, I was just seeing him in the office for other sensory stuff. I didn't even know he was getting a blood draw later. So you know, we started with um, a little my handheld massager, doing some vibration. He liked that. So I did some joint compression. He liked that even more. So I um, put the weighted snake on his shoulders. He loved it. He, they still had time. So I you know, put him under the weighted blanket for a few minutes while I continued to talk to mom. Mom thought I was crazy. She had no idea why I was trying any of the stuff that I was doing. And um, she was like, listen, can you wrap up? We need to go get a blood draw, you know, next. And he does really terrible with that. And I was like, oh, a light bulb went off in my head. And I was like, I wonder if he's going to do better today. And she kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And I tried to explain to her about the sensory input and how it can be a calming effect. And she's like, you have no idea. He needs two public safety officers to hold him down. It's this whole thing. He's terrible. And I was like, well, let's see if he just does better today. Will you call me after, you know, sometime, doesn't even have to be today, sometime next week, email me and let me know if there was any improvement today because he got sensory input. She kind of rolled her eyes, said she would, and they left. So here at the clinic, we don't do blood draws here. We want this to be a safe space. They go across the street and get them in another building. So within, I don't know, 25 minutes of her leaving, she's back in my office door huffing and puffing because she ran back to tell me he walked in, stuck out his arm, public safety was there, didn't have to lay a hand on him. They did the blood draw. He even held the cotton ball on his arm while they put the bandaid on and he walked right out. Now I'm going to tell you, this is like a, not a one in a million chance, but the fact that it worked so perfectly on the first try was amazing, but it's not going to be that easy for everyone. Um, but I have seen with others, it does lessen it um, dramatically, but it wasn't 100% perfect with everyone. So knowing that the sensory strategies for this individual made, you know, did wonders, but these sensory strategies could be used again to help calm that might allow other strategies that are not sensory related uh, to be incorporated, whether it's, you know, using that visual support then to remind them, but they're feeling calm already. So the idea of having to get a blood draw is not going to make their teeter totter start, you know, fluctuating so fast. It's going to be a little slower and they're more open to it. There are desensitization strategies that could be used um, to help build up tolerance to blood draws over time. This is very different than that. Um, but this was a very good success story. Here's case example two. What about that 15 year old or it could be a 40 year old? It doesn't matter, but we know a lot of individuals get stuck organizing the stuffed animals on their bed and it can impact their ability to leave the house. So for this individual, she has eight stuffed animals on her bed. They have to be in the exact right place. If one falls over, she has to fix it. She has to move it. It has its exact spot. And it's starting to get to the point where it's taking her too long to do, and it's impacting her ability to leave for school in the morning on time. She's missing the bus, then her parents have to take her. So what can you do in this situation? So in this case, you can use the proprioceptive input, whatever it might be. Perhaps it's first thing in the morning, she, go, she gets out of bed, she does 10 wall push-ups before she gets ready for, you know, maybe gets dressed and brushes her teeth. And perhaps after breakfast, she does something else real fast. And then she makes her bed so that she gets some sensory input to again, help her teeter totter be even so that she doesn't have to get stuck so much. She can put the eight stuffed animals out. It doesn't bother her as much if they're not in the exact right spot. Perhaps giving her that proprioceptive input, she's more open to if there's a timer going off and she knows she in she only has the time until the timer goes off to organize her stuffed animals. Or if there's a visual schedule, remember her, you know, first make your bed, then it's time for school. Whatever it might be, she's more open to these ideas because she's gotten that proprioceptive input in her body. Then there could be the 30 year old who engages at self talk at work. And for that person, you know, we, there's other webinars on self talk. We don't think self talk is a bad thing, but in a community environment, perhaps someone might think that something's going on that's wrong with that person if they're engaging in self-talk a lot at work. So there's proprioceptive input to help calm and relax. And I have a series of videos I want to show you. 
about a woman. She was not with self-talk at work, but she engaged in self-talk a lot. I do have permission from her parents to show the videos, but I did blur out her face just to help keep some um, sense of privacy. You want me to do what? Uh, oh. So she's not actually talking to me. Okay. We're sitting. Do that. Uh, you know what? It's, yeah. You, you she's sitting in one of the exam rooms where I don't normally provide mm. therapy and she keeps it's looking okay, over right? her shoulder at the otoscope and she's trying to tell herself right. it's okay to check her ears. And unfortunately with her face, you can't see, she makes some grimacing remarks. She's clearly talking in her head right now. She just gestured. She's mm. gonna do some tapping. Um, but she keeps looking yeah. at the otoscope. It's okay, right? And the mm. and the blood pressure cuff. Mm. Mm. So she's trying to convince herself it's okay. Mm. We're just gonna watch it for one more second so that you realize when she's done with the self talk. Yeah. Oh. Oh, you know what? I don't know how to check ears. Oh. So we don't need to do that today. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So then in this next video, we're still sitting in that same room. I put my nine pound weighted blanket folded on her lap to see if it makes any changes. Now, I don't normally just put the weighted blanket folded. And again, unfortunately, you won't be able to see. There's a lot of her looking up and gazing up. So you can tell that she's doing some self-talk in her head this time, but she's not actually vocalizing it. And she's she still looks over at the otoscope a little bit, um, which is actually over her left shoulder. Um, so she's not looking at it right now. Um, but again, her eyes are kind of going like she's she's talking in her head, but not out loud. And just for the sake of time, I'm gonna advance to the next one. So then I actually have her lay out underneath it. So now the nine pounds is evenly dispersed throughout her body and it feels very, very different. So she looks like she's asleep right now. I promise you she isn't. In this video, again, we blurred out her face, but I promise her eyes are open, but you can see she's moving. She's gonna do a little bit of tapping. Um, at one point I asked her if she wanted more time under the weighted blanket. She did ask for it, but her self-talk dramatically decreased the longer she was under the weighted blanket. So her family did end up purchasing one for her and um, tried to use it. Uh, unfortunately, she lived at a group home, so we're not sure how successfully it was used, but um, it was purchased and made a, a huge difference here in this therapy session. So that's my example on self-talk. And then the last example is what about the 56-year-old with Alzheimer's disease who displays periods of agitation, especially around dinner time? So in this case, we're not gonna necessarily do sensory activities. We wanna try some of those sensory accommodations. So we wanna make sure per perhaps that we need the lights on. Maybe they need to be bright lights or dimmed lights. It really depends. You're gonna have to try that with the person. We want to have calming music, perhaps, in the background. You might want to cover the mirrors. So individuals with Alzheimer's, sometimes they don't recognize themselves. So if they see themselves in a mirror, they might think someone else is coming at them. So we try to cover those. You might want to consider calming scents like lavender, perhaps have their favorite food. And those are all things that could perhaps help someone with agitation. Um, but again, it's going to vary about the time of the day. But you really want to consider the environment when it's someone with Alzheimer's and agitation. So I apologize for rushing through some of the case examples, um, but I do wanna allow time for questions because I'm sure there are a bunch, but just some key points to remember is the first thing you should always do is roll out medical reasons for any change in behavior and then look to other providers to see if they can um, help out uh, if it's not a medical cause. Know that sensory processing differences does not mean that that person is on the autism spectrum. Proprioceptive input is going to help everyone keep their teeter-totter even, so encourage physical activities throughout the day. And you can consider proprioceptive input when an activity or procedure may cause anxiety. And when in doubt, talk to an occupational therapist. So with that being said, just a, a plug here for our resource library. That is the website. 
it, when you get these handouts, if you click all resources, you'll have access to all of them. But if you click on sensory, you'll get the sensory specific resources that were shared today, as well as a few others. If you're on Facebook, feel free to like us on Facebook. We do one post a day. And then we have an email list. So there's the link if you haven't signed up for it yet. We send out one to two emails a month. This is how we talk about all the activities that we are offering here at the clinic, what um, activities are going on in the community um, or even available across the country. And then I have a long list of additional resources, whether it's books you can read if you want more on sensory, general websites, websites specifically on sensory diets and equipment um, so that you have those. And here is my personal contact information here at the Adult Down Syndrome Center. And with that being said, I am going to uh, open it up for questions, Laura. Thank you so much, Katie. As you anticipated, there are a lot of questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 15 minutes. Um, so you mentioned that our sensory systems grow and change with us and um, Someone asked if, oh, actually several people asked if sensory issues can develop in adulthood or later in life. Is there anything else you'd like to comment on regarding that? Yeah, I think, like I said, like they grow and change with us. There could be things that develop um, later in life that didn't happen before. And we, I hear that so much, um, even here that parents kind of even forget maybe that something was happening or because they weren't getting that natural sensory input anymore, they started to see different um, behaviors or sensory changes. And so I'll say, oh, well, have you tried this? And they're like, oh, we used to do that. Um, and then, you know, we kind of forgot about it because everything went away. We have to use that again. Um, so I do believe uh, that, you know, our sensory system changes throughout life. And so we're gonna see different sensory challenges as we grow and develop. Thank you. Can stimming be related to sensory issues? And if so, how? Well, absolutely. So I think individuals stim um, because they, well, for two reasons. One, they could be sensory seekers. So these are people that seek out that sensory input because they're trying to make themselves actually feel better. The problem with sensory seekers is that typically what they're doing is making it worse instead of making it better. So that's the challenge for an OT is to try to figure out what the just right fit for sensory input is going to be for the sensory seeker. The other thing, reason a person could sensory seek is because they are under responsive. So again, their teeter totters are always kind of low and they need that extra sensory input. So even more than, than um, typical in order to try to even out their teeter totter. So we often see sometimes people stim to try to do that. They also might stem because they're bored. Um, they could stem because, um, so they're bored and they're trying to get themselves engaged, right, with the environment, or they're overstimulated. So too much is going on and they're trying to stem to calm down. So I definitely think stimming is, or can be related to the sensory system, but it's trying to figure out why they're doing it and then figuring out what you can do to help. So oftentimes giving them something to do with their hands is gonna, at least for hand flapping, but it depends on what other kind of stimming behaviors they're doing. Um, but giving them something to do often helps with self-stimming. Thank you. And we had one question in which a young adult with Down syndrome has developed ways to block out overstimulation, but it now presents as zoning out and it causes the person to kind of miss details and quickly forget what she's been told. Are there strategies to kind of break that habit while still helping to deal with the overstimulation? person is zoning out, then that's because they're overwhelmed with the environment. And so they need to work on the environment so that that person doesn't zone out. Um, so it's, well, that in theory could be a great strategy for the individual to be able to tune all those things out. They're clearly not doing it effectively enough if they're not able to still um, be attuned to the things that they need to in the environment. So I would re recommend some positive sensory strategies to make sure that the zoning out doesn't happen. Um, but also looking at the environment and seeing if you, if that can be modified in order to eliminate some, some of the things that this individual is intentionally um, tuning out that is overstimulating. I don't know if that made sense. Um, Thank you. Can it still be sensory if it only uh, happens at school and not at home, maybe because of environmental differences? Yeah, so yes, um, that is definitely possible. 
oftentimes we might see things happen at school and not at home for that very reason. And, um, you know, it could be another person in the classroom that's making a sound or the lights are flickering and no one else realizes it, or they hear the lockers banging in the hallway. So absolutely, there could be some things that are sensory related because of the environment um, that you're just able to eliminate in, in the home. Um, but uh, oftentimes in that case, you would just want to provide them that, that accommodation. You wouldn't have to provide activities in order to help the individual. You would provide accommodations for them in the classroom setting so that they can um, function. So if you know what that is in the environment, trying to eliminate it. Thank you. Um, you discussed the proprioceptive and interoceptive systems um, and how that can re be related to thirst and hunger and, um, and eating. Can overeating be related to sensory and are there particular strategies that can help? I mean, if overeating is related to sensory, it would be because the individual doesn't ever feel full. And in that case, that would be a sensory thing and that would be interoception. The thing about treating things in the interoceptive system is that you have to work on mindfulness. And I think that is really challenging for many of us, including individuals with Down syndrome. Um, so when it comes to overeating in that case, what you would, I would suggest be done for a modification is to control the portions. Um, and so you would give them a portion that is appropriate. And then if they're still hungry, encourage them to have some water perhaps, and then see if they still need food and then giving them a healthy snack um, or setting a timer and being like, when the timer goes off, you are done eating um, because the likelihood that they're, they need all that food is really low. So we need to teach them um, how to feel in their body when they're full or when they've had enough. And so those are strategies you could do. Um, in order to help with that. Thank you. Um, can you discuss what can bring on increased sensory triggers? I mean, anything probably could. I think it really depends on the environment. I also think that um, oftentimes individuals with Down syndrome really like to be in control. And when they can't control the environment, we might see that things in the environment are, are causing more challenges for them. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of like what comes first, the, the chicken or the egg. I don't know if anxiety comes before sensory or some of these sensory challenges can cause anxiety because I know, for instance, going back to this restaurant example, if you know that there's something about that restaurant that you didn't like last time and then you're being brought there again, you're gonna have anxiety about it. And then you're gonna have um, you know, increased sens sensations to everything around because you're already at that heightened level. Your teeter totter is already wobbling a ton. And um, so in that case, I think that if you know of a, a time, of something that might cause more anxiety for your loved one, or you're worried something could providing some kind of sensory activity before that transition to that environment could be very helpful. Thank you. Can sensory strategies be used to motivate um, individuals who prefer to sit and watch TV or be sedentary? I do think so. So again, kind of going back to um, the, the, in the case example with the person who organized all the stuffed animals, right? So using a sensory strategy could help kind of prepare their body so that they don't get stuck. It'd be the same thing. Um, but if someone's really sedentary and likes to sit on the couch, you want to build in, you can build in like fun ways to do activity on things like if they're, it's at a commercial break, getting them to get up and like run around the couch or to march in place um, and then sitting down and kind of making it a game. Or if they watch, you know, streaming shows, perhaps while they're waiting for the next show or in between shows, they have to pause and get up and do an activity and kind of making, I mean, the, strat the sensory strategies I gave today, all the proprioceptive ones, except maybe the chores that people may not like to do, there are a lot of fun things that you can incorporate. And so just building you know, it into the day is important. Perhaps you do sensory before they even get to sit on the couch and watch TV. And then you set a timer and you know, when the timer is off, screen time's done until we do another activity. And then you can use visual supports. First, we're gonna do 
you know, whatever the activity is, then we'll get screen time or, um, or then it's, or you do the whole day, you do this activity and then you get to watch TV and then you do this activity and then you get to, you know, go outside and then and you get to whatever it might be. And so if you're giving regular intervals of sensory input, again, those, you know, five to 20 minutes every two to three hours, they're going to be more motivated and inclined to do the things that you want them to do. Thank you. Um, a clarifying question, is sensory processing disorder the same as sensory integration disorder? Yes, it is. So sensory integration disorder is sort of like the old school term. Now they call it sensory processing disorder because it's not about what we're in integrating into our system. It's how we're processing everything else that's coming in and going out. Thank you. My daughter tends to dress opposite the weather, short sleeves in winter and sweaters in summer. Could that be related to sensory? Um, I mean, I, perhaps doubtful, but I also wonder, is it hard to transition her from winter where she's wearing sweaters into summer? And so it takes a few weeks for her to realize that she needs to wear different clothes. So that could be more like the groove where, um, and then kind of the opposite where, so she's so used to wearing short sleeves in the summer when it gets into the fall and winter, it's hard to transition her out of that because she's kind of just stuck in, this is what I do every day. Thank you. If a person with Down syndrome has been diagnosed and medicated for ADHD, how can you tell if it is a misdiagnosis of sensory processing disorder? Does the medication work? I would say if the medication isn't working, then perhaps you'd want to look at sensory strategies. I also think it wouldn't hurt to have someone look at sensory, um, even in addition to medicine. Um, but I think the main thing is, is the, is the medication working and doing what it's supposed to be doing? Great. We had some questions about haircuts. Um, do you have recommendations on helping people tolerate haircuts? I think it depends on what the challenge is. So if it's the sound um, of the scissor snipping, seeing if you can use uh, um, a razor, electric razor instead, if they don't like the feeling of the electric razor, see if you can use the scissors. They're also um, on Amazon. There are like sensory friendly scissors that you can use that are almost like the razor, but they're scissors. So they're okay with the sound of the snipping, but they don't like the feeling of the vibration. You can use those. Um, trying to do any kind of sensory strategy beforehand. So, you know, just like when you go to the dentist and if you need to get x-rays, they put that weighted vest on you. That's actually to protect you, but it's a weighted vest. So could you put a weighted blanket on or get some kind of weighted um, covering so that they can wear that while they're getting their hair cut? And that could be helpful, perhaps having calming music. It really depends on the person and their sensory needs, but um, those are some simple strategies. The other thing that might not even be sensory is it could just be preparing them for what's gonna happen. It's time to get your hair cut. Remember, this is gonna happen at the haircut and this is gonna happen at the haircut. It doesn't hurt and then we're gonna go and do this. And so it could you know, be that control issue. Perhaps there was a bad haircut at one point. They might not like have liked one person at one point that gave them a haircut and they keep reliving that. Um, and so sometimes it's not always sensory, could be their strong visual memories. Um, but again, if we give them regular intervals of sensory input, other strategies like visual supports um, could be helpful. Thank you. Um, we'll do uh, maybe one more. Um, and this question is, what about teeth grinding and excessive drooling? Does that indicate a sensory issue? I mean, it could, it could also, um, be, I mean, I would check with a dentist first to make sure there aren't, there isn't any in, um, issues with their teeth or gums um, because perhaps there's pain and we don't know it. And that's why they're grinding their teeth. Uh, they could be grinding their teeth because they're bored. It could just feel good. What kind of foods are they getting in their diet? Are they only eating soft foods? Then they're not getting that natural input into their, into their mouth. So trying to do crunchy foods, uh, chewy foods, foods that are, you know, eating meat, um, because that's really hard to chew and swallow. Um, so giving them pieces of that so they actually have to work. But that's part of the problem too, is individuals with Down syndrome don't often like to eat really hard foods to eat like meats because it takes too much effort. And because of their low muscle tone, it's just too difficult for them to chew and swallow. But really looking at what's already going into the mouth. Um, with the drooling, I mean, it could be because they... Um, are so under responsive and they need more. And so their mouth's kind of always left open. You could also talk to a speech therapist about the drooling. 
to see because it could just be they need more muscle stimulation in order to keep the mouth closed and to stimulate, um, initiate a swallow. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for your presentation today, Katie. And thank you all for joining us today. We didn't get to all of the questions, but we do encourage you to check out our resource library. You might find some additional um, information that will be helpful for you. And um, thank you again, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.